thank you so much for the invitation, and it's exciting to be the first uh, speaker in your uh, series. So I grew up on a farm, and when I was 11, my parents, who were missionaries, decided it was time to get back to the land. My dad had been uh, an early proponent of organic gardening. So my parents didn't have very much money, but my father had a really uh, fond memory of growing up, believe it or not, in the Dust Bowl. I'm not quite sure why you have a fond memory of farming in the uh, Dust Bowl. It was very difficult to, in the 1920s to make a living as a farmer. But he remembered how good life had been when he was young, and he wanted uh, us to have that kind of experience. So we ended up on a farm not too far from here. It, it, in fact, in those days, it felt very far because Washington, D.C. in 1963 was a little sleepy southern town with almost no suburbs. There were no super highways coming into the city. And my farm out in Virginia, actually, it would have taken a couple of hours to get into the city because there was really no direct route. So the farm itself was uh, it's kind of funky. There was a mile-long driveway that um, had really deep ruts. No one had lived in this house for mm, about three decades. It didn't have plumbing, and it didn't have electricity. You can imagine my mother was really thrilled about this. When I was 11, I thought it was neat. By the time I was a, a teenager, we did have uh, electricity. But my dad never did think it was important to put the plumbing in. So, um, you know, I grew up, though, doing things that most young people, even in those uh, times, didn't have the experience of plucking chickens, uh, squeezing potato bugs, chopping kindling. We always cooked on a cook stove. Um, and, you know, basically living a very real lifestyle. I was really. Uh, unhappy when my dad would uh, pick me up in the dump truck, which was the best vehicle for getting in and out of the driveway uh, at the uh, local high school. So you can imagine, as a teenager, I couldn't wait to get out of there. And I did, in fact, leave and go to school and uh, become an activist. I've always done advocacy work. And mo more recently, since the uh, really the um, turn of the century, most of my work has been focused on food and farming. And I did go on and inherit that farm because I'm an only child. And my husband does uh, run it today as a community-supported agriculture program. So I feel very fortunate I get to live in, in kind of both worlds. Now, what I have learned from working at Food and Water Watch, in fact, working at, in Washington for several decades, is that the only way we really change things is through political action. If we were going to win on the facts, we would have won a long time ago. We would have an improved food system. We would have a lot more economic and social justice. You name the issue. Uh, if we were to win on the facts, we'd already be there. So we at Food and Water Watch have been trying to find or uh, figure out the best way to go about activating and mobilizing the most people possible. And in doing that work, uh, one of the things that I've seen is that a lot of people blame farmers for the state of our dysfunctional food system. You hear a lot about this from the environmental community. Generally, I think the Washington Post had an editorial just this week uh, uh, calling farmers greedy. And I think what we need to realize is that mid-size and small farms are barely surviving. And if we really want to transition into a sustainable food future, then we need these farms to actually survive. So a mid-size grain farmer in this country makes an average in income $19,000.2. And half of that is from a government payment. Now, there is something wrong with this uh, picture. And what I want to do tonight is discuss how we got to that situation and then what we really need to do about it. So I'm going to go back. I'm going to ask you to bear with me. I know it's um, 
Friday night, you could be out with your friends, having a cocktail, doing something fun. Um, I'm going to ask you to bear with me with, on a little farm history and um, some statistics. And I do know what Mark Twain said about statistics, lies, damn lies, and statistics. And a lot of those um, untruths have been told about farming. Now, we're going to start with how many farmers there actually are here in the United States. Any ideas? Yeah, it's, uh, the USDA says 2.2 million. Uh, we believe that it's under a million because the USDA actually counts um, entities that aren't farms, like my friend who uh, grows um, flowers for a white tablecloth restaurant. She has about $1,000 in sales a year. She's counted as a farm. So when you break down the numbers and you look at the, uh, the USDA statistics, those farmers who are actually depending on their farm income uh, and running the, the farm themselves, they're about just under a million. So farm policy or modern farm policy really began in the 1930s when the Roosevelt administration came into office. And it's important to know what programs that they instituted to try to fix things in rural communities. You'll remember that we were uh, in the United States at that time in a very severe depression. And people in the rural areas were suffering um, really greatly. In fact, at that time, 54% of the population lived in the countryside and was engaged in agriculture. Today, about 16% of the population lives in a rural area, and uh, most of them aren't engaged in agriculture. But at that time, there was a lot of malnutrition, and a lot of people were losing their farms. They were being driven off the land. So when um, Franklin Roosevelt came into office, his advisors put together a farm program that actually passed in 1933. That was the first farm bill uh, that did some important things for farmers. It created a grain reserve so that when there was a drought, um, there would be grains in silos spread around the, the countryside. When there uh, was abundance, uh, the grains could be put in the in the silos and stored on the farm. And the idea was that it, we wouldn't have the wild uh, prices that we see today where speculators bet on, um, basically bet on grains and we see a lot of famines. Having a grain reserve really s stabilized the price. We also saw things like uh, um, the ability of the USDA to advise farmers to take land out of production, especially marginal land. Uh, we saw programs to make sure that farmers made the cost of production, which is a very important uh, point because today farmers often don't make the actual cost of production in growing their crops. So all of these programs worked pretty well. They did uh, begin to take the rural population out of this devastating poverty. And when the US um, engaged in World War II, these farm programs made it possible for the US to basically be the food basket for the world, certainly for the Allies. And after World War II, when Europe was devastated and couldn't feed itself, the US was uh, producing the food that was necessary to keep the population from starving. Now, other things have really changed after World War II, and we all know this from our history lessons. The uh, financial center of the world moved from London to New York. Um, the um, industry and manufacturing, the US had become the industrial giant in the world, no longer Europe. And there were a group of businessmen who saw a new future uh, for the US and certainly for the economic interests that they represented. And they believed that capital should replace labor and that we needed many, many, many fewer farmers. In uh, the 1930s, when the first farm bill passed, there were uh, 6.8 million farmers, many of them uh, uh, living on very small farms. So these men um, got together, and they were interested in other economic uh, and social policies, but they were very interested in agriculture policy because they needed cheap labor for factories. 
So they created an organization called the Committee for Economic Development. And um, the, the people who initiated this uh, kind of club trade association uh, became an advocacy group uh, uh, eventually. It was the CEO of Studebaker, CEO of Eastman Kodak, Studebaker for you young people who don't know was a large car company of the time. And there was also an individual who was involved in the new science of consumer research and how you actually persuade people to do things through advertising. And so they put together this organization and they began to meet and recruit other business leaders. Eventually, they had most of the titans of industry uh, join the Committee for Economic Development. Uh, they got uh, many of the universities, the most prestigious universities, uh, the institutions uh, of that time that um, published print media, uh, many of the very important institutions in the country. Now, I'm not suggesting that this is some kind of wild conspiracy to uh, destroy farming. This is simply uh, um, individuals, well-placed, influential, who saw a different vision and had the, uh, uh, the resources and the ability to begin lobbying for the things that they saw uh, that they believed would be beneficial for themselves. And I'm sure in many cases, uh, these individuals thought it would be beneficial for the country. So, by the 1950s, they saw their opening to begin getting rid of the farm programs from the 1930s. And this was one of their number one targets because they didn't want young men to go into farming. Their goal was to get young men out of farming and trained for industry, especially for um, the um, workforce that was needed in the growing uh, industry and manufacturing plants uh, the, of this nation. So when the Eisenhower administration came into office, they had an opening because one of the secretaries of agriculture under the uh, Eisenhower administration was a man named Ezra Benson. And he was, he was pretty much of an ideologue that fit into this period uh, of the McCarthy era. He believed that, um, you know, farm programs, the ones that the uh, Roosevelt administration had put together were going to lead the country into communism. He uh, very uh, strongly believed that uh, all of the farm programs should be uh, done away with, and if, the, um, if a farmer couldn't make it on his own, um, he didn't want to see any government involvement. So under the Eisenhower administration, they began to just begin to chip away at some of these programs. But Ezra Benson was very influential and had a very dramatic effect on the Department of Agriculture. Now, meanwhile, the Committee for Economic Development was becoming much more influential. And by the 1960s, they were able to put out a report called an Adaptive Plan for Agriculture that laid out their agenda for food production in the future. It included getting rid of all of the farm programs. Uh, it included changing education programs in rural areas so that young men, and it was young men at that time, uh, going into farming would um, uh, choose a, another profession. And they laid out also their vision for a more globalized food production system because they believed it was more efficient to grow grains uh, here in the United States and to grow fruits and vegetables other places in the world where labor was cheaper. And if you look at what they wrote in this Adaptive Plan for Agriculture and then a follow-up report that they wrote about trade, you will see that most of the things that they suggested about outsourcing food production and a lot of other uh, related issues um, actually came into being when the U.S. joined the World Trade Organization and became a party to different trade agreements like the North America Free Trade Agreement. So meanwhile, um, every five years, that farm bill that originally passed in 1933 was debated again. And even today, we're supposed to uh, pass a new farm and food bill every five years and appropriate the money for those um, programs. And we'll talk a little bit about uh, the dysfunction of today. 
But uh, so in the 1960s, they began to chip away at uh, this, uh, the programs especially that helped farmers uh, recoup the cost of production. So by the 1970s, when uh, the Nixon administration came along, one of Ezra Benson's protégés uh, took over the Department of Agriculture. And uh, his name was uh, Earl Butts. Now, most of you are too young to remember Earl Butts. There are a couple of uh, people my age uh, in the uh, audience. And Earl Butts was a, uh, he was a real character. And um, you know, today I bet most people can't even name who the uh, uh, Secretary of Agriculture is. But in those days, because Earl Butts was, uh, well, he had a big mouth and he often put his uh, foot in his mouth, he got a lot of publicity. And his message was, get big or get out. And he advised farmers to borrow all of the money that they possibly could to buy new equipment and to plan on an export market. And he got on the um, speaking circuit in rural areas, and he talked to a lot of farmers. He was very persuasive, and a lot of farmers actually took his advice. They borrowed a lot of money, they bought new equipment, they rented land, and there was only one year in the 1970s that there was actually an export market for grain. And that was when there was a, um, a grain failure in the Soviet Union. So there was no export market. And so farmers started losing their farms because they borrowed a lot of money and they put their farms up as collateral. And during this period, we lost hundreds of thousands of farms. And in fact, uh, there were lots of movies that you can find on Netflix today about the farm crisis. There were, were books. I mean, it was, a, it was a really sad period. Farmers uh, uh, brought their tractors into Washington and uh, did blockades. They went to state capitals. But basically, they didn't get any relief. So we really began to see the, the agricultural crisis. And farmers have never really recuperated from it. So in the 1980s, um, when the Reagan administration came into office, um, uh, President Reagan was certainly no friend of agriculture. But one of the ways that President Reagan was actually elected was some of the economic interests that helped elect him, like the oil and gas industry, a lot of uh, large companies that wanted to be able to get bigger, that wanted deregulation. Um, one of their main targets was to get rid of the laws or to weaken the laws that keep companies from getting large and gobbling up their competitors. So that was the era that we began to see the dramatic changes to antitrust law or the laws that are supposed to uh, protect uh, consumers from the monopolization of companies. So in writing um, Foodopoly, I had the opportunity to actually interview Michael Perchuk, who was a commissioner at the Federal Trade Commission at that time. He's retired and lives in Arizona today. He's an elderly man. And he told me a very uh, sad story about what happened at the um, FTC when he came into office, or when uh, James Miller came into office, the uh, Reagan appointee. Uh, he, as you would imagine, slashed the budget, got rid of whole departments, laid off staff, made things that had been uh, against the law legal, like letting competitors uh, merge or acquire one another. And probably most importantly, he, they narrowed the definition of what an antitrust violation is. And that had a very dramatic effect on our society, and not just on food and farming. That was really the era when we began to see the massive consolidation and concentration of companies. And most of you are so young that you've just lived in a world where you know you have two or three giants in every industry that basically control that industry. But it didn't used to be that way. And the, um, from the end of the 1940s into the uh, 1970s, we had some pretty good antitrust uh, laws and enforcement. And uh, companies didn't want them. Uh, they wanted to be able to get bigger. So what happens when companies get larger? 
and absorb their competitors. Well, they get a lot wealthier. And so we began to see the uh, merger and acquisition frenzy in the late um, 1980s. Of course, it's gone on ever since then. But as the companies began to get bigger, they also became more politically powerful. So by the mid-1990s, when the trade negotiations were going on, many of the economic interests that were really pushing for uh, a, a trade agenda that outsourced things like food production and manufacturing and uh, all of the things that have had a profound uh, effect on our society, they had a lot of political power. And the Clinton administration was in office when the, uh, world, when the U.S. joined the World Trade Organization and became a party to NAFTA. And uh, they were very uh, vigorous supporters uh, of this agenda. Now, once the uh, U.S. became uh, a party to the trade agreements, it meant that there was a lot of pressure to then get the farm programs in line with the trade agreements. And so in 1996, again under the Clinton administration, because it's always easier to get these things done under a democratic uh, administration, right? It's easier to get rid of Social Security. It's easier to, to weaken our laws when a, uh, a Democratic president is in office because uh, uh, the Democratic base is uh, less likely to scream and kick when there's a Democratic president in office. So uh, uh, what we saw was the, um, a, a bill that was nicknamed the um, uh, Freedom to Farm always very dangerous whenever something comes out of Congress with freedom attached to it. <laughs> and um, what this meant was that um, all of the supply management functions that the USDA had had were basically done away with, with one fell swoop. Everything that had all of the last vestiges of those 1933 laws. So the grain reserve was done away with. Uh, the ability to take for the USDA to take uh, marginal land out of production. All of these things went away. And so what happened within two years? Well, by 1998, that bill passed in 1996, the cost, uh, or the, uh, yes, the cost of corn had plummeted by 50%. The cost of soy had gone down 40%. Because when you have no supply management, Farmers have every incentive because they know it's going to be really tough because prices are going to be very low. They, they have an incentive to grow from fence row to fence row and to try to take advantage of all of their land and equipment. So we began to see very, very low prices for commodities. So um, by 1998, there was tremendous political pressure on Congress because um, farmers were going out of business. They were already suffering in rural areas, and this low cost of uh, commodities made it even more painful. So in Congress, uh, often, uh, usually these days, unwilling to really enact policies that solve the problem, did what they could to protect themselves politically. They decided to use taxpayer money to help ensure that farmers could actually continue farming. And so they had an emergency program in 1998, you know, the subsidies people talk about. And by 2002, uh, those programs were uh, permanent. And so the uh, subsidies that we hear a lot today about are about 17 years old. Now, who really benefited from that? Now, we always hear, we know that the very largest farmers uh, or, you know, the really contract operations benefit. There are about 300,000 out of that, um, just under a million farms. But who really benefits from cheap corn and cheap soy? Let's, let's analyze this a little bit. So the uh, soda industry needs to buy a lot of corn, right, for high fructose corn syrup. So they saved about a billion dollars from the low cost of commodities, not from the actual subsidy, but from the low cost. The meat industry was completely restructured because now there was cheap feed. So in 1995, let's talk about hogs. They're a good example. In 1995, about 30% of hogs were grown on 
contract Smithfield type farms. And that number, that had happened because of the uh, beginning consolidation of the meat packers gave them the ability to begin uh, uh, making it very difficult for farmers in some parts of the country to be independent. So we began to see contract hog farming. By 2005, 95% of hogs were grown on factory farms. And that happened as a result both of the meat packers getting larger and having more economic power and because of cheap feed. Cheap feed basically changed the way that we grow animals in this country. Now, eventually, uh, the cheap feed um, began to go towards biofuels, and the price of corn has risen in the last few years. But so has the price of farming. So farmers are still finding it very, very, very difficult to make a living. If they're mid-size or small, you have to have a lot of land to make a living because the price of seeds. We have only a few handful of seed companies, and the price of seeds has skyrocketed. This year, it's going up 7 to 10 percent. Uh, the price of fuel uh, is often much higher in the summer. The price of equipment, all of the, the price of inputs, uh, fertilizers, and all of the things that uh, farmers need to uh, actually grow crops. All of these things have skyrocketed in cost, and so farmers find it very difficult to make a living. There are other beneficiaries, and you know, you all look sleepy, so we're going to do a little exercise just to wake everybody up, because I know this is a lot of history and a lot of uh, um, statistics. So would everybody stand, please? So what I'm going to do, just to make things interesting, is um, read a list of brands, and if you have had a drink of one of these brands or eaten one of these brands, I'd like you to sit down. And just so nobody's embarrassed, I would be sitting down in the front row right here. So um, Pepsi, Mountain Dew, Aquafina. Sit down if you've had one of these ever. Yeah. <laughs> um, Sierra Mist, Tazo, Sobe, Slice, Lipton Propel, Gatorade, Tropicana, Naked Juice, Captain Crunch, Aunt Jemima, Near East, Rice-A-Roni, pasta -roni, Puffed Wheat, Harvest Crunch, Quaker Crisp, King Vitamin, Mothers, Lowe's, Maui Style, Ruffles, Doritos, Cheetos, World Gold, Sun Chips, Sabertones, Cracker Jacks, Chester's Grandma's, Munchos, Smart Food, Baconets, Matador, Hickory Sticks, Hostess Chips, Miss Vicky's Munchies, True North. I won't read any farther. Now, why do you think I'm reading this particular list of brands? The, the largest food company in the United States uh, produces all of those brands, PepsiCo. And I do know we're being generous in calling PepsiCo a food company because most of those items are not food. <laughs> so the point is that uh, the ingredients for junk food are basically uh, some of the most important ingredients are from corn and soy. And these companies have benefited enormously from the overproduction and the ready availability of these crops. And today, while people are blaming farmers, we have 20 food processing companies that really control most of the brands in the grocery store. You know, uh, and Americans go into the grocery store and it looks like, oh, there's this fantastic diversity, all of these brands, all of this competition. Well, 20 food processing companies uh, produce and own 60% uh, of the brands that you see in the grocery store. You know, the top five are companies besides PepsiCo, uh, Nestle, uh, Kraft, Tyson, and the uh, giant meat company that if you're a meat eater, you no doubt have eaten a product, but you probably didn't know the name of the parent company, the huge Brazilian company, JBS, that is now the largest meat producer in the world. They own Swift and, and um, Pilgrim's Pride and a number of other US companies. So these companies have figured out, and there's a lot being written about this today, uh, how fat, sugar, and salt can be used together to create recipes that basically addict people to food. And because these companies have such enormous political power, 
because when you have a lot of money, you have a lot of money to, in our system of legalized bribery, really unduly influence uh, government at every level. So we don't have uh, uh, controls on advertising for children. So if we want to talk about why children are addicted to junk food, the average child sees just under 5,000 junk food TV ads a year. And you know, when you go in the grocery store, there's horrible cereals that uh, children should not be eating for breakfast are placed right there at our level because children are one of the biggest determinants of what the family eats uh, because they pull on their parents' uh, you know, jacket and say, I want that, I want that, and it works. And they also have found that children really very early in life, around two years old, begin to have uh, brand allegiance. And that's one of the things that these companies want is brand allegiance. They want uh, young people to very early on um, want to eat a specific brand. So it's all about um, marketing. But the food processors really are not the biggest um, uh, influencers on our food system and how difficult it is for farmers to make a living and for consumers to actually get um, decent food. Really, the most powerful entities are the chain grocery stores. We have four chains that dominate um, food sales in this country. Walmart is the largest. One out of three grocery dollars is spent at Walmart. You may have noticed that there was a, uh, a New York Times front page article last week uh, that was uh, documenting how Walmart has uh, um, has 57 fewer workers in each store today, and one of the effects is that the produce is uh, really in terrible shape, and they're uh, getting a lot of criticism for the bad uh, produce. But anyway, Walmart uh, has tremendous volume, and it's uh, affected the entire grocery industry because it's put out of business most of the traditional grocery chains or made them much smaller so that they've had to consolidate. So the, the uh, uh, three other very dominant chains are Kroger, um, Target, and Costco. And these stores have such tremendous needs for volume that they've really changed the structure of the food system. So all the way down to the farm, we see more and more consolidation because when a store like Walmart figure it needs a billion pounds of uh, uh, beef every year. Now, Walmart doesn't want to deal with, you know, five or six medium-sized suppliers. It wants to deal with a couple of uh, meat packers that can uh, provide product for it. Walmart has a very uh, crafty model for sucking all of the profit all the way from the farm, from the soil, all the way up to uh, their distribution network. They do this by requiring anybody who supplies them to adopt their logistics system, to use their, uh, their uh, tracking system, all of their internet systems. They have to manage their own inventory. Um, if there's a problem with uh, uh, the inventory, the suppliers get fined. Uh, they have a, I have a chapter on Walmart in Foodopoly. Uh, they have an amazing way of doing business that is even threatening these very giant uh, food processors and making them to continue to um, consolidate. So we've just seen uh, Cargill and ConAgra, two of the top 20 uh, uh, largest food uh, processors, announced that they're joining their uh, flour um, uh, operations. And so uh, one out of three slices of bread will come from this new corporation called Argent. We see it's even affecting uh, things like beer. Do we have some beer drinkers here? Usually people perk up uh, when I talk about the consolidation in the beer industry because it's really affecting the microbreweries. We have two foreign corporations that control beer, beer sales in this country. So you go into the grocery store, you see all those brands. Mm -mm. There are two brands, basically, for 80% of them. Uh, AB InBev, Anheuser-Busch InBev, and uh, South African Brewers uh, Miller. 
which are now UK owned. And they have uh, bought up all of the brands and they have two um, distribution networks. And if the microbreweries don't uh, hitch their wagon to one of these distribution networks, they can't get into grocery stores or convenience stores. And also, these big companies are uh, gobbling up the microbreweries. And in fact, right now, there is a debate going on because Anheuser-Busch's parent company wants to buy the uh, Mexican parent of uh, Corona because Corona hasn't been getting with the program and raising prices every year and has been uh, uh, going head to head with uh, Anheuser-Busch's parent. So the Department of Justice is looking at this and they'll make some kind of deal, but uh, probably not one that's going to be uh, sufficient to really uh, uh, maintain any kind of competition. So we could look at any of the uh, different items uh, in the grocery store. It doesn't matter whether it's, you know, um, frozen vegetables or beef or any, any, uh, any category, and we have this kind of massive consolidation. And that's why there's so much control of our food system and dictating federal policy, everything from labeling to pesticides. So I know it's uh, kind of daunting. And I sure didn't write Foodopoly to bum anybody out or to, you know, so that you just decide, oh, let's just go to the beach and forget about it all. I'll, you know, I'll go to the farmer's market and take care of my family, but forget doing anything about this. I wrote Foodopoly because, I, you know, I think we need a call to action. And there are a lot of smart people who really care about the food system and really, um, you know, a lot of people who are foodies even and who just want access to good food. And it's great when people vote with their fork, but we, we've got to get people to take the next step to vote with their vote and then to uh, actually keep these people we vote for accountable. And I know it sounds kind of idealistic, um, and actually um, the, um, the entities that are controlling our political system, you know, they want people to feel really apathetic and, and uh, like nothing can be done. And so it really takes working at the local level and the state level and beginning to reclaim our democracy. And I think that uh, food activists can play a really important role in this because, you know, let's think about uh, the campaigns that are going on across the country now. Uh, there is a, uh, uh, a real fight back uh, against the, uh, uh, the proposition in California for labeling genetically engineered food, Prop 37. Uh, because we're now not just seeing the ingredients on our plate genetically engineered. We're beginning to see, well, corn, sweet corn was approved. We're about to see salmon. And a lot of people don't want to eat genetically engineered food. And actually, when you look at the polls, um, about 90% of people believe in labeling, no matter whether they have no problem with genetically engineered food or not. People believe they have a right to know what they and their families are eating. So when the processed food industry, including Monsanto, spent $45 um, million in the last few weeks of the uh, Prop 37 campaign on TV ads to tell people that it was going to be too expensive to label, it really made a lot of people around the country mad. And we have seen a big fight back. We've seen legislation introduced in about 30 states won't pass the first year, but after a couple of years when people are organizing at a state level, it probably will. There is a very well-funded initiative in Washington state that actually has a chance at passing because uh, uh, there will be money on the, uh, uh, the pro-labeling side this time around. So I just use this as one of the examples about what happens when people get mad and get up and start organizing. And we need to do this on a lot of issues. We need to do this on antibiotics. I mean, we basically have 80% of antibiotics are being used to raise factory farm animals. We are losing the efficacy of antibiotics. We see diseases like MRSA uh, killing uh, thousands of people. And the CDC isn't even properly collecting the statistics of everybody that's dying from some kind of antibiotic resistance. I mean, this is a crisis. And I believe that these issues 
you know, that hit people in the gut, that hit people um, where it matters, their families, uh, can inspire people to get involved. So, you know, I see it as uh, part of strengthening our democracy because really, if we don't uh, strengthen our democracy, we can't change the food system. And if we don't do something about our democracy, I mean, really, what kind of future do you young people have? So we really need to get people up and away from their entertainment centers and out in the streets and uh, uh, organizing. And there are a lot of ways that this can be done on a lot of different issues. So why don't we have uh, comments and questions? Mm -hmm.